So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Martin, and I'm here today to explain how to integrate Active Directory with Keystone. Uh, first, a bit about my background. I'm a tech writer at Red Hat, uh, where I work on the OpenStack and uh, Keystone and Neutron documentation. Uh, but before becoming a tech writer, I was actually a sysadmin in Active Directory and VMware. Uh, so I imagine many of you are here today because you have an OpenStack environment and an Active Directory environment, and you want to be able to integrate them together in some kind of meaningful way. Uh, and specifically, you want your AD users to be able to use their username and password to log into OpenStack. Well, uh, if you haven't done that kind of integration before, uh, I, might have, I might understand why, because under Keystone version 2, you might have been expected to do a few things that you, know, you weren't exactly comfortable with. Uh, and well, I have an entire slide to explain those things, and so I'll get to that. But um, I, I will say that uh, first I need to describe that this procedure is looking at the here and now today. So this is what customers are doing in Kilo and Liberty uh, with Red Hat OpenStack 7 and 8. This is how people are today in the market integrating with Active Directory. Uh, and uh, so first I'll explain what's being discussed in this talk. Uh, I'm going to give a very quick overview of Active Directory and Keystone, uh, how they relate to each other for the purposes of this talk. Uh, I'm going to de describe exactly what you, know, you needed to do under Keystone v2 and you know, why you might have been unhappy with that. I'm going to talk about how Keystone version 3 solves all of those problems. Uh, I'm going to make a big deal about encryption using LDAP-S, and then I'm going to also go over the steps that Windows admins would need to do, and then also what the OpenStack admins need to do to their Keystone and Nova. Uh, I have a demonstration prepared in real time, and then we're going to look at just the high availability options to make this a bit more resilient. Uh, there is also a landing page for this presentation. Uh, you'll see the URL over there. So that's where I have a link to this guide. That's the, the partner guide. I have a link to the slides. And whatever else that I feel is relevant, I'll throw in there as well. So if you feel like you need to take notes and everything, well, uh, some more background is that the, there is a whole integration guide that we've created that talks how you can do this integration with uh, IDM and Active Directory and just generic LDAP. So if you go to that page, you'll see a link to that guide, and everything I'm saying here gets unpacked in full detail right there. Cool. Uh, so a very short overview of Active Directory for purposes of this talk. Uh, it is, in fact, a Microsoft product, and it uses an LDAP backend to uh, hold a central repository of user accounts. And these accounts get replicated in a database to a number of servers. These are known as domain controllers, uh, described here as DCs. And so any change maker on one DC will get replicated across to another one. That's pretty handy. It is considered LDAP compatible. And you can encrypt your LDAP lookup traffic using encryption, LDAP-based encryption. Uh, so I just make a note there specifically to say that tested in my personal lab, but also what customers are running. Uh, I've seen customers using Server 2012 R2 for this integration, uh, 2008 R2. And anecdotally, I've tested this myself with Samba4's domain controller emulation, and it actually works identically to what I've done before. But I suppose whether that's actually supported by your vendor or not, that's going to be a question for your TAM or SRM. Uh, so quick overview then also of how Keystone fits into OpenStack. Uh, Keystone is essential to anything working in OpenStack. Uh, it performs AuthN and AuthZ services. So, that, so the AuthZ is you know, using credentials and, and uh, oh no, sorry, I always get this mixed up. The, the, the AuthZ is with, uh, no, I was right. <laughs> the, the authentication is the username and password and the authorization is how the Keystone validator, you actually have access to the permissions that you claim to have. Uh, it's also the way that tenants are managed, so you can keep users segregated from each other. And endpoints for all these services, how they would in integrate with Keystone, it manages the endpoints. And specifically, this, uh, this validation is done with Keystone version 3 multi-domain. So if you're running Keystone version 2, you're going to need to use Keystone version 3 for this to work. 
uh, in order to get access to the multi-domain compatibility. So th the old way that you might have seen on the internet and a bunch of documentation out there is for Keystone version 2. And this is a long list of reasons why you might not have wanted to do this. Um, so it required you to create a bunch of AD user accounts and instead use those service accounts instead of your local uh, accounts that you were using for each component. Uh, so th this, as you can imagine, resulted in a lot of concern for people because, you know, if yeah, you, you lose a lot of control over your, over your OpenStack environment. You know, if something happens to your service account while it's in AD, uh, you know, it could become disabled or, you know, some security policy gets applied that, you know, disables it or the, the password expires. Uh, you know, you're going to have a bad time because, yeah, that service could get impacted and not be able to start properly. Um, I suppose also for political reasons, OpenStack admins are going to lose control of service accounts. Uh, you know, you might not always like that. But then there are also things to make the AD admins uncomfortable, uh, you know, because it required writing to LDAP. And, you know, if, if you can avoid that, that should be the way to go. Uh, also, yes, you'll see steps that require you to actually make changes to the AD schema, which is a, you know, as major a task that you can do to your AD environment. You know, if, if something goes wrong, you know, all authentication could potentially fail. And to recover from that, you, you know, you'd have to take the major step of shutting down all your domain controls, powering one up, restoring from backup, then letting the good one replicate all its goodness back to the bad ones. And, you know, Active Directory is unavailable for the duration of that. So, you know, if, if you can avoid making change to your AD schema, that's really what you want to do. Uh, so Keystone version 3 solves all those issues that I've just described. Uh, Again, it's, it, this is using the multi-domain support that is what en enables this. So your, your service accounts stay locally in your Keystone database. Uh, there are no AD schema changes required and LDAP read-only. These are all things that you know, are going to make a lot of people feel more comfortable about this integration. Um, also, yes, if your domain controller becomes unavailable, it's going to not affect services. You know, the service is going to keep running. Uh, what, who will be impacted will be those number of users who have, you know, their user accounts in Active Directory and are expecting to be able to log into OpenStack while well, they're not going to be able to. Uh, but I'd describe later on how to make that configuration more resilient. <clears throat> yes, encryption is important. Um, so let me go back to the previous slide. Uh, you'll see, uh, I'll just highlight there, so a user logs into Horizon and they authenticate with the username and password and that goes through to Keystone. That's great, but what's going to happen is that Keystone is going to query the domain controller and that connection under vanilla default 389 lookup is not encrypted. So it's going to look like what I've highlighted here, clear text, SVC LDAP, password there in clear text for anyone to go and grab. Uh, this yeah, yeah, is the result of just a TCP dump running uh, on eth one So I think I've made that point really clear. Uh, I'm going to describe next how you can solve this and how you configure LDAPS encryption on both the AD side and on the OpenStack side. So I think I've made that point very clear, in encrypt. Uh, so here is all on one page everything you need to do for your LFS encryption. Uh, I will first give you a tour of, uh, oh, let's go to the, so, so here is the, the Active Directory domain controller. Uh, there's going to be a certificate. So your, your Windows admins are going to the very first step. Step one, they have to uh, go and export the certificate that they've configured. Uh, it's going to be the local, under local computer for that service. They're going to need to export out the certificate, and they'll know it's the right one because they'll have set this up previously, and it'll be the one that's using server authentication. So they export that out as a let's go back as an x509.cer file. Uh, they can use the, the GUI just to do that, and then they securely you know send that to you. You know you can use whatever secure means are available to get that onto your OpenStack server. And then you're going to convert it to a .pem file from the 
previously used CER. And then, well, I suppose for, for RHEL, you're going to copy it into that location and then update CA Trust, and that'll you know, make RHEL aware of it. You know, if, if you're using a different distribution of Linux, you, you'll have equivalent steps. And uh, then in order to get Keystone to use it, you're going to copy it, you're going to convert it again, and then com copy it over into that uh, Etsy SSL search directory. So there, there's a later step where you configure Keystone to refer to that location. So I'll get to that. But here is a, the LDAPS configuration on one page. So that what I'm describing here isn't going to happen to you. Um, oh, yeah. So here on one page as well is everything that your Active Directory admins are going to have to do. Uh, there is another little step that happens later on, but it's pretty optional. Uh, so this is PowerShell code. Uh, so they're going to create a new AD user called uh, SVC LDAP. Now, th they can choose whatever name they want, but I've just used SVC LDAP you know, just to give it more of a service account name. And this account does not need to have any special privileges. It does not, doesn't need to be an admin account. Just normal user will do. You create it, s set a password for it, uh, enable it, and then you would then create a new group called grp-openstack. And that group is going to be the group where all the users that need access to this Active Directory, uh, sorry, to the OpenStack environment, they're going to need to be members of that group. So create the group, then add the user that you just created into that group, and then that'll be all they have to do, except for a little bit later. And then for the ongoing BAU of adding, continuously adding more users to that group and removing them according to your business practices. Uh, so here I talk about what needs to be done on your controller. So uh, if you're not using controller concepts, this would be on your Keystone server. Uh, you're going to configure SE Linux, because obviously you're running SE Linux, or you might have an equivalent, but that's what you need to set on it. And then uh, you need to create a domains subfolder. So this is a, a new Keystone v3 specific step. You create a, a folder called domains, and then you give the Keystone service uh, ownership of that. And then you go into your regular keystone.conf, enable domain-specific drivers, and then you point it also to that uh, folder that you just created. And also, what you see there is the back end is still going to be SQL. Uh, that's the built-in for uh, authorization. Yes. Uh, so some more steps you have to do on your controller. Uh, you're going to configure the uh, local settings for dashboard. Uh, so what this is going to do is, on your dashboard, what's it's going to look a bit different. I'll take you out here. So yeah, what's going to happen, what's going to appear there now is a new field called domain. And so when your user logs in, they're going to have to type in that domain. Uh, that field is not case sensitive, so they can use some variation that they're familiar with. And then as a result, they'll be able to log in with their username and password, I suppose once you've completed the rest of the steps. But that's going to be the change to the user experience. And so returning. Uh, so a, a step for the window, Windows admins, if they don't really know it, they're going to need to get the NetBIOS name of their Active Directory domain. In this example, it's lab. And then you're going to create a corresponding keystone domain, also called lab. Uh, it doesn't strictly have to be lab, but uh, it doesn't strictly have to match what's in the uh, AD domain, but that's going to be the field that gets entered here. So that's going to be you know, useful for the users to keep it consistent. Uh, okay, so you've created that domain. And so, so now on this page, these are all the steps that uh, are going to go into this new keystone.conf file. Uh, so this is in the new domains folder that you've just created. Uh, you're going to create this new file called lab uh, keystone.domainname.conf. And here is everything on one page of how, what that file is going to look like. Uh, what I've highlighted in red over there are the settings you're going to need to think about. Uh, that you're going to need to change. Everything else is an underline. You'd most likely be able to keep it as is. Uh, so the, the URL is LDAPS. As you can see, uh, on port 636, that's for the, the encrypted LDAPS port, not the 389. Uh, for user, you can see SVC LDAP is in there. Uh, so this is, the, is using the distinguished name. Uh, if you're not sure how to get your distinguished name, 
in AD. I'll show you right here. Let's go out of that. Uh, so you can use a tool called Add C Edit, and in Add C Edit, it gives you your same view that you have of your Active Directory, but with just more of the guts revealed. And you locate your SVC LDAP account and properties. So you find distinguished name. That is the value that you're going to paste in. So that easy. There's also PowerShell ways to do it, but I thought the GUI would more, be more representative because you're going to need to populate a few more distinguished name fields in there. Uh, let's see. Uh, OK, so, so here's uh, what's cool is the, this is the user filter. Uh, so what this means is that you're giving the distinguished name of the GRP OpenStack group that you created earlier. And the result of this is going to be that that is going to limit the visibility that Keystone is going to have to your Active Directory. So when it does lookups, it's not going to pull down the entire database. It's only going to look for members of that GRP OpenStack group. Much more efficient. And just gives you control, more control over who's getting exposed. Uh, also, yes, yeah, this is what I mentioned before. You're going to specify the path to that TLS CA cert file that you converted from all those various formats before. Next slide. Um, yep, you're going to give the Keystone service ownership of that, of that file. And then, uh, so here I'm sh uh, showing how you give the built-in admin account access to that domain. So you, you get the UID of the, of the lab that you just created, of the, of the lab domain that you just created. You, you, find, you get the UID of the admin account. That's the built-in admin account, because we're specifying domain default. And then you're pulling down a list of all the available roles. And then in that, in that bottom step, you're tying this all together and creating a, an, a, a command where, uh, for the domain in lab, and for user matching that UID admin, you're going to give them admin permissions, yes, to that tenant. Uh, yeah. So, uh, oh yeah, so some, some final configuration that you're also going to have to do for your compute nodes. Uh, you're just going to have to set them to use auth version v3 so that they're aware of Keystone v3, and then restart the necessary services in order for that to take effect. Uh, oh, yeah, so as a result of all that configuration, you can now go to your Keystone server and ret retrieve a list of all the Active Directory users. And what you're going to get back is a list of everyone that's in the member of the GRP OpenStack group. Uh, you're going to pull down a list of roles. And then in this example, user one, who has that UID, is going to be added to the demo project. Uh, as a regular member, as member, and that's going to just make them a general user. So, so this is what this would have to be a BAU task for you. Uh, anytime a user needs access to that, you just follow this step. Yeah. So, as a result of all these changes, authentication is uh, going to be limited to just certain users in GRP OpenStack group. Uh, they need to be members of that group, of course, and the crucial. Authorization, what I just demonstrated over here, that is still managed by your OpenStack admins. Uh, yeah, and by example, they need to be explicitly added to a tenant. Um, ah, I'll demonstrate all of that now. So I will just uh, pull up the notes. Uh, so first of all, let me show you. So this is my, my pack stack. Uh, OpenStack environment. And here is my Active Directory server. This is server 2008 R2. And over here, you can see a list of all, of all the users that I've created. And you can see the GRP OpenStack group. Uh, you can see the members of that group is this bunch of users here, including SVC LDAP and Kate and Lisa and Timmy. So in theory now, when I run the OpenStack user list command for the domain lab, I can expect to see them come back. And yes, there they are. Lisa, Kate, and Timmy, SVCL lab. Uh, 
Also, uh, also another way to pull down a list of users is using the LDAP search command. Uh, let's see. So this bypasses, oh wait, I need to put in the correct magic word, which I have here. <laughs> so this is just a raw dump from LDAP. Uh, this is a good way to test that you have that initial connectivity because this bypasses what you've entered into the keystone.conf. So when you do an LDAP search, it's just going to you know, let you know that there's like no firewalls in the way and that you're using your, your SVC LDAP account is correctly configured. But here, I mean, you, you can see there's, there's Timmy, there's Kate, Lisa, and the GRP OpenStack group. Um, OK, so to, to demonstrate the workflow a bit, I'll create a new user. Uh, Dorothy. Cool. And then Dorothy needs to be a member of GRP OpenStack. So we'll get her in there. OK. So now, when I do the OpenStack user list group, we should expect to see Dorothy in that list. And so there she is. Uh, so now, though, before we've done any kind of uh, authorization, Let's see what it looks like when she tries to log in. Let's see what happens, because now the OpenStack admin hasn't gone and actually given her access to any tenants. Let's make that camel case. So you can see there, uh, you're not authorized for any projects. So even though she can log in and it authenticates her, She's not getting anything because the OpenStack admin hasn't done that yet. Uh, so now let's demonstrate how we're going to give her that access. Uh, so we have, we have Dorothy's UID. OK. Role list. We're going to pull down the list of the roles, and then we're also going to get the uh, list of domains. A product, project role? Yeah. Oh, let's check. Okay. Open stack. Yep. It's domain lab. Ah, yep. So now, oops. Oops. So putting in Dorothy's UID, and then uh, making her an admin. Now, when Dorothy tries to log in again, she is now authenticating, and she's able to. She has administrative access to the demo project, and she's able to do all the usual things you might expect. Yeah. Um, also, uh, I'll show. You, so I mentioned all the service accounts before. There, they're all still within the default domain. So that's, I guess, the default domain is the default domain. That's where the service account remain untouched and not in AD. That is all I'm going to demonstrate. Um, 
quick talk about the high availability options available to you. Uh, yes, you can do general DNS aliasing. So uh, you can create a DNS alias just for one domain controller and then have it uh, intermediary between the others so that you know you can you, you'd have to go in manually each time the one domain controller does, goes down and update that alias to the, uh, the other IP address or the other domain controller. It's not really super ideal uh, and, and you know because there's going to be an outage while you know the admins realize that the server is unavailable and then they have to go and manually update the field and then also wait for it to propagate out but uh, it's, it's an option I've seen people use. Uh, you can also have a hardware load balancer in between. But uh, here we go, the comma separated list of domain controllers. So what I mean by that is so in your keystone.domainname.conf file, just have a comma separated list here. So comma and then the full LDFS string of another domain controller. Uh, so, so that what's going to happen is that authentication is going to continue going to the domain controller until it becomes unavailable, and then Keystone will send those queries on to another one. A uh, few, few things about that sort of setup, though, is that you don't want this, the firewall on DC1 or the intermediary firewall to silently reject traffic from the Keystone server, because uh, that, that can affect the way that Keystone automatically detects the unavailability of that service. So just something to keep in mind. Yeah, as I say all the time, test these in your environment first. You don't want to wait until it's actually gone down before you know what's going on. Mm. Oh, yeah, so getting near the end. Uh, so and if, just a final link again to, that, uh, re to the resources page. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, so I have the slides, I link to the guide, and the event page, and where I am on LinkedIn. So just everything on one. I'll, I'll update this with uh, probably a link to the YouTube of this talk when that becomes available. Uh, and then also just to talk more about uh, what's in the Keystone integration guide. Uh, so it includes, yes, yeah, full detail of everything I've described. I haven't covered absolutely every step. I've just highlighted the ones that you, know, you might have questions about. There are still a few things here and there that are going to need to be done differently. Uh, also talk about how you can troubleshoot these things, steps along the way, you know, if, if you're doing something, you're doing an LDAP search and it's not going the way you expect, I talk about options for, for how you can do that. And yeah, because I'm a former sysadmin, I went and included things that you might get asked during the CAB meeting when, when your, your ITIL guys are, are going to ask you tough questions. Uh, specifically, uh, the impact, so just like the one-liner that they need to say, you know, what exactly are you doing, well, that's in there and also talk a bit about the outage requirements. Uh, oh yeah, this is where I've mentioned before, you know, these, this, these configuration tips are, are very similar for Red Hat IDM and for generic LDAP, and they are, they are there in the guide. Uh, let, me, let me actually pull up this guide I'm talking about all the time. So this is what it looks like, uh, Active Directory integration, key terms, I describe assumptions, there's the impact statement, all these steps in detail, and then, yes, some troubleshooting. So then I do this all, all, all over again for IDM and for generic LDAP. So if you're integrating with these things, I, I could suggest you look here as well. Cool. Oh, that's everything. That's the end. Thank you. Is there someone there with a the question? Yes. Uh, yeah, OK. So that it okay works. So my first question is, uh, since as you mentioned with the version three of uh, Keystone service, mm. uh, you do support the case when LDAP server itself is read only. Yes. Right. So yes. In, yeah, in that case, it will cause issue because the internal uh, OpenStack service account uh, cannot be created in the LDAP server. So I know looks like we have the solution uses uh, multi-domain. So we keep the existing local service account with mm. the local domain. We create new domain for LDAP account. Yeah. So in those cases, uh, we would have security issues. Say mm -hmm. in case OpenStack service need to access some something across the domain to LDAP domain. Uh, no, no. But uh, I can let Adam Young answer that one. He's He's got to. Oh, so it works. Okay. He says, uh, yeah. Um, so, I could go on and on. 
Oh. Yeah. Oh, I can. I can. You have a service user. I don't. Oh, know, here you go. There's actually a rule that says don't give Adam a microphone. Um, <laughs> you ask the Keystone guys. They're pretty strong about it. So what you have with um. Thanks, Adam. Okay, like I said, uh, so for those of you who don't know, I'm Adam Young, Keystone Core. I also work for Red Hat. I did the original uh, LDAP implementation, which is why he's deferring to me here. But um, if what we say is different, he's done it more recently. And as I tell everybody, I lie. So verify everything that I tell you. Because <laughs> um, I also don't remember which versions things work and which way it. Um, as far as that goes, there is no security issue because it only has access to OpenStack um, resources, okay? So if you have, say, a Nova user that's stored in the SQL backend, which is where these uh, local users go, it cannot get access to Active Directory type stuff for outside of Keystone. So I don't know how there would be a security issue there. Uh, yeah. My thought is in case the service account for Nova, right? right? If there's any chance Nova service need to access user information, but those inf user information are in different domain. Mm -hmm. The domain is different from the Nova service account. So that's kind of like cross domain access, right? So this is domain as Keystone understands it, not a domain as in Active Directory domain. Yes, yes, so, yeah, the Keystone domain. So, so that, that's allowed. You can set that up. In Keystone, you, when you do a role assignment, mm -hmm. a role assignment can be across domains. You can say user in domain one has this role on domain two okay. and stuff like that. So that's Keystone's job now, is okay. to do these kind of role assignments, which is exactly what he was showing when he was doing the assignments there, for a project or for domain-specific operations. OK, sorry. What? Yeah, one more question is, I mm. saw you demo the whole thing with the Red Hat version of OpenStack. Mm. Uh, so is there any compatibility issue, you know, if we test everything with the standard OpenStack version, when we really start to go to production, which we also use the OpenStack, uh, your version, right? So something I took out of this talk, which is really cool, is I did not know that this could work with Swan before. And so what I, I think the answer is going to be, we've been talking about how to do uh, continuous integration w for the LDAP stuff. We don't even have continuous integration for straight LDAP, um, which the Active Directory stuff is a subset of. We could potentially use Samba 4 as the CI approach to making sure the Active Directory specific stuff works. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to do that. So thank you. So basically, basically that means the Red Hat version of OpenStack is compatible with the standard uh, version. Well, this is all upstream. This is all upstream. He's just demoing from, from Red Hat. OK, sorry, <laughs> one more last question. Yeah. Uh, I saw the demo, and you use LDAP. But in your demo, you always have very small user list. But in mm. reality, in big enterprise, right? Mm. We always have huge user list. Yeah. So when you create, you know, user manager, the first step you want to list the user. But with enterprise situation, that mm. will not work. Oh we yeah, I'd, I'd expect they'd be using OpenStack. Uh, sorry, uh, PowerShell for yeah, for access but, but, to that list. Yeah, we already had this issue because mm. when we test this scenario, it doesn't work. We cannot mm. list the user because oh, it's yeah. huge. So what's the plan in OpenStack to fix this issue? He's saying you could turn on paging. Um, I'm going to say don't do that. <laughs> I'm going to say don't list users. In general, um, with federation, you're not going to have access to the user list anyway. So the goal is to get away from list users as being something that you do. Now, it makes it really painful in order to do role assignments, and we've got problems to solve there. None of this is Active Directory specific. Um, also, your, when you list users, as um, some company who will remain nameless found out, if you don't limit the number of results that come back, your queries could take a really long time, like hours, to come back. So you probably, on the AD and in, in LDAP side in general, should limit the number of results that come on back. Um, so there's a lot to be done there. Let's let other people ask some questions. OK. I, I wanted to, uh, I'm over here. Oh, wait. So, uh, oh. Over here. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Uh, so I, I know, I think it's with Kilo that it, it's implementing some uh, group-based um, Permissions, I guess. So, so my question is, you know, in order to, to grant, when, when you created Dorothy, mm. or, or whoever the name was, mm. you had to go in and grant them access to as an admin to a project. So mm. is there an ability to specify a LDAP group to have certain access into a project? I, I do know of people doing that. 
Uh, I actually, just this last week, I was attempting to replicate that in my, in my lab. Uh, it does seem like that there could be customer demand for that because that's going to ease the workload. Uh, absolutely done, and it works now. When he added her to that, what would you call that group? Uh, oh, GRP, GR I can say. He could have created a role assignment on that group mm. so that as soon as you added Dorothy to that group, she could have logged in. He okay. just created, mm. a, he created an individual role assignment, but a role assignment in Keystone can be on either a user or on a group. And so long as the user has that group, um, there's return when they do the LDAP query, they will get a role assignment automatically. So, so yes, that, that works now. Is or only Kilo? Uh, Essex. That's been there since LDAP support's been there. Okay. Thank you. And this is a so great demo. Thank um, you. I see from the demo you are doing authentication with LDAP and authorization locally. Yes. Um, is authorization also supported with LDAP, like if uh, we want user to be assigned a particular uh, way? We removed it. Hmm. What's the reason for that? Because LDAP is read only. Yeah. Yeah. The, the people seem to really want their LDAP to be read only as much as possible. You don't have LDAP schema that maps to things like roles very well. A yeah. group is essentially the same concept. So instead of trying to force custom schema into AD or whatever your LDAP server is, I use read only, do group based role assignment. Thank you. Okay, um, so I, I saw that you, you used a kind of a proxy account for the LDAP. So mm. you, you had some user to log in and have an LDAP search in a given container for users mm -hmm. and as a way to do the authentication. So for a general LDAP, you, you should have give certain permissions for that user to read the password attribute of the, of the object. Uh, do you have to do this kind of thing for AD as well? No. So it's, it's automatically granted, right? The, way he, the reason he did it that way is because of most AD setups, um, you don't have anonymous. But if you had anonymous browsing there, then everything could be done, done anonymous. The only thing that's done as an explicit user is that when you uh, log in as that user, it does a simple bind. And that's how it authenticates the mm -hmm. users. So that's not done as that admin account. That's done <coughs> as that user's account, and then that's dropped. And then the, um, the admin account that he, he set up there is strictly for like the list users and, and the general query <laughs> capabilities. Yeah. OK, so, so no, no extra ACLs are needed for that? No. For that. No, that, that, was a, that was just a general vanilla user account. OK. Yeah. Okay. Hey, the scheme you laid out required you to create a group in Active Directory that was dedicated to the OpenStack users. Yeah. Um, if you have a campus group that doesn't want to mess with groups like that, mm. and they don't care if you just use Active Directory for authentication, mm. and they're ready to let you see everything, it, it, is that doable? That that will work too. Uh, Adam, or yes. why wouldn't you? Or why wouldn't you <laughs> yes. do that? Is uh, there a good reason not to do that? Just to limit who can get access to OpenStack. Yeah. Well, but aren't you controlling access to OpenStack on the OpenStack side? You have to assign them to a project. You're authenticating and then authorizing. Yeah, authorization can be an open source. Yeah, okay. yeah you, you, you could, but you know, there, there are some business practices that, pre pre that prefer having you know, multiple layers of control over a single transaction. Can you go back to your config slide? Yes. That one. So you can see in here there's nothing that actually filters. That you don't see group in there anywhere at all. Um, member of, user filter. Um, yeah. That's the one place you, you can drop that out. Drop that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We don't have business rights about national labs. So. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, if you have 10,000 users, is there something I should be looking out for? I heard list mm. users. Is there anything else? Uh, well, I know from the AD side. I don't, I don't know. Well, in uh, I suppose what's uh, something to consider is that you know your these lookups are going to be hitting a single domain controller. And so just having that second one in the list isn't going to have like round robin lookups to them, right? So yeah, you, you want to at least have some monitoring, performance monitoring of, the, of your DC. Uh, you might have to scale it up, just uh, adding additional resources. On the uh, OpenStack side, I think. The oh, on the domain. Fine. On the Active Directory side. Yeah. Um, on the OpenStack side, hmm. 
Oh, I wouldn't imagine so. Oh, I'll answer from paging. Paging. Is, okay. You need to consider paging. So everybody thinks it should be good. I will try it out. Thank you. Cool. Um, I have two questions. First one, uh, if you can go back to your um, config set, uh, file for a moment. Yeah. Okay, so under user filter, uh, actually, sorry, under user 3 dn um, hmm. say I specify an organizational unit because that's yeah. how pretty much, will it be recursive? So will it search on for the OUs underneath it? Yes, there's not a setting that's shown here, but there's an LDAP scope. Yeah. So you want to make sure oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 be yeah, because in V2 you couldn't search underneath. It was yeah, only in the static. Okay. Um, all right. Mm. And the other question is, um, will it, can I use global catalogs? So if I have, if I have three domains, mm. I can, and they all share the same parent, I can search from the parent to the global, through each three, like, Big company, so you have it uh, separated mm. by continent. So I will use the global catalog. So I don't yeah. have to specify three domains. I set up the parent through a global catalog, so I can say, look everywhere. Is that supposedly work? Oh, this. Right. The, 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 only, the only problem later is going to be if you pull 100,000 users. Right. Then you have to do pages, pulling whatever. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can try to avoid the list operations. You can even change the calls to files so that somebody can do a list of users. You know, that that massive. Yeah. yeah. Let me answer a slightly different question from what you asked, though. Okay. Because if you don't have that single tree for all of those, so people probably in that case with M and A, um, you can set up multiple domains where mm -hmm. they're all looking at the same AD server, where the difference is the tree that you have there too. So it may make sense to say, you know, if we have, you know, Bank of America just bought Chase, and so we still have Chase's Active Directory out there, right. put that in its own domain-specific backend like this. Everything else is going to be roughly the same, but the, the, the trees that you use for those. Okay. Thank you. Hmm? I just want to jump in with a couple things. You've only said one thing here that's actually incorrect. Oh, yes. Which is you do not, even under the old stuff, need to change the schema. That was like the one yeah. rule I had in Violet, that is, we, we had oh, to yeah. work with the default schema. So everything mm. is in place that you can work with Active mm. Directory without doing the schema, even with the old way of doing things. But oh, I, I, I mentioned that because I actually yeah. saw docs that, uh, multiple docs that actually prescribe schema changes. So yeah, yeah I wanted to put that to rest straight yes. away. So yeah. bullet in the brain, no matter what, you don't need schema changes. Um, mm. Why don't you ask your question and I'll get with the, the rest of the stuff. Mm. Um, so. Two questions, really. Uh, the first one is, if I only have one uh, directory, regardless if it's AD or not, do yeah. I have to specify a domain? OK, so that was, that was in the, uh, my mm. notes for what you had there. It's mm. only on the horizon config um, mm. where, where you do that. You can actually do two things. One, you can actually change the default domain. Now, so long as all your service users are using V3, as Izzy pointed there, those can still, the domain default, the ID will still be default, but Keystone will say, if you're asking for a V2 token, you can give it out um, that way. And so for a lot of backwards compatibility issues, that's, that's uh, an issue. So you can say that, you know, domain ID, big long UID, is the default domain, in which case you don't have to make that change in Horizon. The other thing, mm -hmm. though, is in Horizon, there's another config option that uh, you don't know about yet, obviously, yeah. which says, here's the domain to you. So even though if I'm doing V3, I don't have the, the, that mm. value there, and it pre-fills out the domain. Oh, yeah, yeah, there. you so can do it's, that. It's in the local, local settings file, an option to, uh, to say this is the domain to use for people logging I, in. I, I know there was once a time when I couldn't get that working, so I left that out, but it sounds good. Yeah. Um, hmm. And then just to, not to beat a dead horse, but just to make sure I understand, going back to the authorization discussion earlier. so. If I have a directory, again, not totally just AD, but if I have a directory with groups that I can use to manage um, authorizations, can I use those groups to manage authorizations for different roles inside of Keystone? Absolutely. And I was almost tempted to have them pull up the demo again and show that that works. You can do a group-based role assignment. Okay. So anything that comes through as a group will be 
available for role assignments. The reason why we don't push that that hard is because typically we say AD and LDAP is, is read only and you're not going to have access to that information. If you do have that degree of power, um, then, then yes, you absolutely can use it. Um, now, the other thing you can do is you can assign users to groups in other domains and do all sorts of wonky stuff where you can actually manage your groups within Keystone, but that's beyond the scope of zero. And that's, again, nothing AD specific. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The recording, so if you, if you can. Oh, yeah. yeah, thanks. So to expand on that question, you were saying that in order to, your question about the role assignment, that's if you change the schema within no. the actual. No, no, no. I'm tempted to have you just show that. <laughs> but no, it's the groups. The, all, remember how he explicitly added that user to the group? He was doing it because of this filter right here, but it's also going to show up in the list of groups that's returned when you do the query. The, the general pattern is this. You go to Keystone and request a token as the end user. The first thing it's going to do is take the password you did and the user you have, build it into the DN, and do a simple bind just to authenticate you. Yeah. Then as that admin user that he added there, the, the user line they have in the second, it's going to do list groups for users. Okay? And that's going to come back as a second list, and you can do any group assignments based on what's returned there. So the, where, where is that group assignment key pair value? It's in so where, where are you setting that into in Keystone? So it doesn't show it here, but all of the user underscore attributes, there are a whole bunch of group ones, too. Okay. So whatever type of group you're using, um, posits groups, whatever, you just tell it what attributes to do. So what's the membership attribute? It figures all of that out. Um, one thing when using groups is to do group-based role assignment. Groups didn't exist in Keystone v2, so if you connect to do a role assignment over v2, you won't see any of the group commands with like the OpenStack client. So be sure to connect with v3, and you could do group lists from LDAP, and you could do group-based role assignment then. Thanks. Thank you. One other thing I want to clarify, v2 <laughs> versus v3 is the API version. Every version of Keystone from, I want to say, Folsom or Grizzly onward, supports both. You don't have to redeploy Keystone. You don't have to change anything there. The only difference is the auth URL that you use to talk to it. The standard auth URL ends with slash v2.0, or the, the ones in all the documentation. There's discovery that's supposed to work that you don't even have to add the version onto it. But if you want to force it to, to v3, it just ends in slash v3. Of course, we didn't do v3.0 because, you know, why be consistent? But it's all, all, it's not a different version of Keystone. It's the, the versions of the, v, the Keystone API, and they are both supported everywhere. Very few people know how to actually remove them, um, and those people have voided their warranty. Just to expand on the group thing again, um, does all this, the group assignments, does that work with AD nested groups as well? Yeah, um, we don't have the config up here for it, but there's <laughs> query options for saying, what is the query that you do to get back the groups? <laughs> so, as so long as it comes back in the query that you say, here's the groups that the user has, then yes, you will get those. It, it works yeah. if you use member row, because I believe the way AD does is it populates the member row, Okay, just, just a quick question. Uh, responding to, to, to a previous saying you had, so that you said that the first thing that what the user does, or the authentication is given, that you bind to the, to the alley, if you will, the user. Is it? Yes. So that's a way to authenticate. That, don't you need to have a clean DAX password for that? A plain, plain uh, text uh, password the, is needed. The user for does pass their plain text password in the token request. Yes. Is that an issue? Uh, okay, but you you don't have it in your hand. I mean, it's not stored anywhere. It's not. It, that's just so. So the way it works is it uses an LDAP simple bind. So the user passes their plain text password to Keystone. Mm -hmm. Keystone looks up the user, finds the DN, and then it attempts to actually do an LDAP bind as that user and passing the password. The hash comparison is done by Active Directory or whatever LDAP server it is. You don't need any, Keystone doesn't need any read access to the user password attribute. So the LDAP server does okay, all of that. But I, uh, well, maybe I'm wrong, but when I, when I debug, let's say, the, the communication to Keystone, so when I'm talking to port 5000, I see some 
SH1 and hashed password traveling over there. So it's not a clear text. So could it be decrypted on no. the Easter sign? Or what is that? Or well, this is the password. What, is, what I'm just authenticating to the Are you concerned from a security perspective? I got a really long answer for you. Well, it's, it's the clear text password definitely is passed all the way through. So I mean, for what you're seeing with a hash password, I'd be curious to know what that is. But you can't, you can't authenticate to AD or another LDAP server with a hashed password. Uh -huh. um, you might be thinking of maybe Keystone doing some of its own hashing comparison, but LDAP, you have to use a clear text password. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, folks, I think we're low on time. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks for attending. You're great.